Let's give him all the glory. Appreciate him for the privilege and the blessing of being in his presence. Our Father, we give you thanks. We bless your holy name. You are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of all glory. You are worthy of all honor. And you are worthy of all adoration. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you and thank you, Lord. Now begin to ask him to speak to you this morning. We have come into your presence, Lord, for an encounter with your word. Visit me by your word today. Let your word come forth with power. Let every situation be turned for a testimony. We give you all the praise. Thank you, mighty God. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today for the blessing of being in your presence. Your word says, blessed is the one that you choose and cause to approach you, that you may fill him with the goodness of your house. And for it, Lord, we say we are grateful. You have called this day our covenant day of restoration. Let there be comprehensive restoration by your word. Whatever the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar may have eaten before now, we declare that via the encounter in this service, there shall be restoration. In the name of Jesus Christ, send your word with power and glorify yourself this day. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Give Jesus a big hand, everybody. And please, you may be seated in his presence. It is my year of breaking limits. All through this month in our Sunday services, we have been looking at a series of teachings which concludes today, entitled Understanding the Cost and the Cure of Ungodliness. Understanding the Cost and the Cure of Ungodliness. We have come to discover in the course of this month that ungodliness carries a gruesome cost. Where anyone's life is left to sail in the direction of ungodliness, the outcome of that life is devastation and destruction. It takes a godly life to have a glorious destiny. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29 and verse 30, it said, Whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate, that he may be conformed to the image of his Son. He said, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And those that he called, them he also justified. And them that he justified, he also glorified. From the scripture, therefore, it takes justification before there can be glorification. That means that where a life is not sanctified, it cannot be glorified. Until you are separated from sin, the beauty and the glory that God has ordained cannot become a reality in our lives. That is why the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1, it says, Therefore, brethren, dearly beloved, it says, Having therefore these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. The cost of for ungodliness is gruesome. That is why the value of godliness is actually inestimable. It becomes important for us, therefore, to pursue godliness with all that is within us so that each one of us can begin to enjoy the blessings that follow therein. I see grace coming upon us to pursue godliness in this season like never before in the name of Jesus Christ. Every hold of the siege of sin on any life shall be broken upon this mountain in Jesus' name. Somebody believe it, say it louder, amen. amen. In the first two services, God, servant, our Father made a very striking statement. He said, there is no devil in hell that can stop faith from having its way. If you are going to be victorious in the battle against sin, among other things, faith is an absolute necessity. In James chapter 4 and verse 7, the Bible makes us to understand this. It says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But how do you resist the devil? 1 Peter 5 and verse 9, it says, whom resist steadfast in the faith. 
So faith is our weapon to resist the enemy and come to the point of triumph. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, the Bible says, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We are meant to see very clearly from Scripture, therefore, that faith, when engaged, the enemy has no answer to it. In Mark chapter 9, verse 23, it says that all things are possible to him that believeth. Now, hear this. Jesus will never give us a commandment for which he has not enabled us to obey. If he says to us, therefore, be thou holy, then it means he has given us the grace to be holy. If he says, be thou perfect, then he has given us the grace to be perfect. What we must engage is our faith to dislodge the hold of the enemy. Therefore, today I pray that every hold of the enemy upon any department of your life shall be broken in the name of Jesus. Amen. Somebody believe me, say a loud amen. amen. I said somebody believe me, say a loud amen. amen. In fact, I heard God, Samuel, and Father say also today that the believer cannot fail until our faith fails. What yields to a fall is the failure of faith. Luke chapter 22 and verse 32, Jesus speaking concerning Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, he said, the devil seeks to sift you like wheat. He said, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. I have prayed for you, verse 32. I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. So faith failure is what gives birth to fall. If your faith is intact, you are able to triumph. And that is why I pray today that the grace to keep our faith continuously in place will come alive within each one of us in the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody believe it, say it louder, amen. amen. And that's why all through the scripture you find it repeated four different times, the just shall live by faith. The justified life can only take place by faith. Habak I mean, um, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 3, the just shall live by faith. Romans 1, 17, the just shall live by faith. Hebrews 10, 38, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 5, 11, the just shall live by faith. It is a continuous requirement to live a sanctified life. And that's why I pray today that the grace to keep your faith alive will come afresh upon you today. If you are the one, say louder, amen. amen. I said if your own faith will be coming alive, say loud, amen. amen. And as we have been taught over the years, faith is in levels, faith is in degrees. At salvation, we are given what the Bible calls the measure of faith, Romans 12 verse 3. But then there is little faith, there is great faith, there is exceeding great faith. There is exceed, exceeding growing faith. So faith is in degrees and we must keep growing from one level to the other. The moment your faith is sufficient, your victory is guaranteed. The moment your faith is sufficient, your victory is guaranteed. I pray that for each one of us, the grace to build up our faith in order to withstand every one of the wiles of the enemy will come afresh upon each one of us. The last battle you lost will be the last one forever. You believe it, say it louder, amen. I say you believe it, say it louder, amen. So simply take responsibility to build up your faith. And you will find that every one of the fiery darts of the enemy are cheaply quenched. I see each one of us walking in this dimension in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now. This month, God has been talking to us about the subject of godliness. And the question is, why must we exercise ourselves unto godliness? Why? Why must we exercise ourselves unto godliness? What are the consequences if we do not do so? We look at four different things quickly this afternoon. And I trust that the Holy Spirit will give us understanding as we do in the name of Jesus. Number one, ungodliness blocks our access to supernatural breakthroughs ungodliness blocks access to supernatural breakthroughs. According to scriptures, the pathway to breakthroughs is revelation. It takes the breaking forth of light to enjoy the breaking through of life. 
If you are going to enjoy breakthrough in life, there must be the breaking forth of light. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 1 to 3. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For darkness will cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. It says, Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Verse 8, who are these that fly as the cloud and as the doves to their windows? And verse 22, it says, a little one shall become a thousand and a small one a strong nation. And I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. What is God showing us there? The breakthrough of verse 22 started in verse 1. Arise, shine, for thy light is come. So revelation is the foundation of breakthrough. But revelation cannot be accessed without godliness. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 23. It said, turn ye at my reproof. It says, and I will pour out my spirit upon you and I will make known my words unto you. For anyone to gain access to the secrets of God, to the mysteries of God, to the hidden, you know, secrets of God in scriptures, that individual must live a godly life. In Psalm 25 and verse 14, the Bible tells us, The secrets of God are with them that fear him. He will show them his covenant. The secret of God is not accessed by experience. It is not accessed by pursuit alone. It is accessed by revelation. Until God shows you what he has hidden in his word, you cannot see it. It takes God opening the eyes of his people for them to see the light of what he's showing. That's why the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, We all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory as by the Spirit of the Lord. So you cannot be changed beyond what you see. And what you see is determined by what he shows. And what he shows is determined by how you live. When you live a life that is, you know, practical expression of godliness, you are positioning yourself for access to divine secrets. We take a case study from the life of Job. In Job chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, we are told concerning Job, there was a man in the land of Oz, his name was Job. He said he was a perfect man. He was one that was upright and feared God and eschewed evil. And as a result of that, he became the greatest of men in the East. And how did Job attain this greatness? Chapter 29 and verse 4. The Bible says, Job said, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. His lifestyle was godliness, and as a result, he gained access to the secret of God. The secret of God is the maker of stars. And you and I can simply gain access to the secrets of God on the platform of godliness. Shout hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. So where an individual lives an ungodly life, they have come to the point where their access to divine secret is blocked. And that means that there is no access to breakthrough. And where there is no breakthrough, there will be stagnation. And from stagnation, there will be breakdown. That will not be anybody's portion here in the name of Jesus. Somebody believe it, say loud, amen. amen. Number two is that ungodliness destroys destiny. Ungodliness destroys destiny. In Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, the Bible makes us to understand there, it says, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So according to scriptures, we see the depiction of one of the things that displeases God there called pride. And he said, where pride is present, there will be destruction. Where there is a haughty spirit, there will be a fall. It means that the destiny of individuals are destroyed at the place of pride. And we have two very vital case studies in scripture. The first one is the study of the man called Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a great king of Babylon. And one day, he looked at the things that looked like achievements around him. Chapter 4 of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 30 to 33. 
He looked at the things that looked like achievements around him. And he said, is this not the great Babylon which I have built for the glory of, for the honor of my majesty and the might of my power? He just entered into a moment of strange arrogance. And God heard him. And look at the response of God in verse 31. While the word was yet in his mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. You are just talking now, but God is responding instantly. He said, the kingdom is departed from thee. What else? He said in verse 32, he said, and they will drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. And seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdoms of men. And he giveth it to whomsoever he will. Look at that. Just one moment of strange arrogance. And God responded. And we know the story, Nebuchadnezzar went into the forest. For seven years he was there. Until he began to understand that indeed God reigns. Shout hallelujah. Pride goes before destruction. And a haughty spirit before the fall. To show how unnecessary Nebuchadnezzar was. All the time he was in the bush. Nobody was on the throne. And everything was still working. God was proving to him that you have no finger in what is working here. We must come to understand when we are dealing with God, walking with God, we must maintain this attitude of humility because it is part of our sanctity. It keeps us in the posture of recognizing that everything around us is the finger of God. Let no man ever deceive you. Whatever seems to be working in your life is the hand of God working it. Shout hallelujah. hallelujah. I've heard God's servant and father say this. He said, there is no great man anywhere. He said, every seemingly great man is simply enjoying the backing of the great God. So wherever you find greatness, it is the greatness of God manifesting. Never arrogate the glory to yourself. Second case study we have in scripture is the story of the man Herod. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts chapter 12, verse 21 to 24, that on a certain day, Herod was arrayed in royal apparel and he sat upon his throne and he made an oration unto them. He was an eloquent speaker. And as soon as he finished talking, he said, the people gave a shout, saying it is the voice of God and not of a man. And look at what the Bible says. And immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost. Immediately. I checked and I began to wonder, what did Herod say? He said nothing, but he felt something. Inside of him, glory that belonged to God, he swallowed it. I've said this over and again that the glory that belongs to God is poisonous to men. Don't ever swallow it. When people seem to point the glory of God to you, quickly return it to God. Fast. Herod kept quiet until the angel slapped him. And right there, the Bible says, worms ate him up. And when you read that account very clearly, you will discover that the people were deceiving him. Because the Bible says that the people were, they knew he was offended in them. So they have begged one of their colleagues to say, just help us beg the king. Anything the king said, whether it sounded good or not, they will heal him that day. Just because they wanted to be rescued from their predicament. And in that moment where a deceptive glory was given to Herod, he took it in arrogance and pride. And as a result of it, he was destroyed. One of the things that takes place when sin is permitted is the destruction of destiny. The destruction of destiny. God has great things in store for every child of God. The destiny of every redeemed child of God is glorious. But it will require that you and I position ourselves in a life of godliness to see the fullness of his glory manifested in
lives. May God grant us grace for this in Jesus' name. Number three is ungodliness engenders untimely death. It engenders untimely death. In Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 11, the Bible tells us there, it says, as the partridge seated upon eggs and hatched them not, so is he that getteth riches and not by right. He shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at the end he shall be a fool. In other words, if anyone accesses riches by crookedness, what he has done is to cut short on his lifespan. He said he will leave it in the midst of his days, and at the end he shall be a fool. We have the accounts and scriptures of various individuals that made a choice for material gain over integrity. And as a result of that, you saw the effect on their destiny. You have the account of the man called Achan. Achan, his family, everything, including his animals, were killed on the basis of taking what did not belong to him, covetousness. Please let us understand this this morning, this afternoon. If you are going to live a life that is pleasing to God, what you are doing is securing longevity. Longevity is the portion of those that live godly lives. My prayer is that each one of us will receive grace to live godly lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. amen. I said, somebody believe it, say louder, amen. amen. Somebody believe it, say the loudest, amen. amen. So ungodliness engenders untimely death. Untimely death. James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. The Bible says, if any man is tempted, let him not claim that he's tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, neither does he tempt any man. He says, but every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own loss and enticed. And look at verse 15. It says, then when loss has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So if you want to enjoy longevity, God says there's the platform for it is the life of godliness. May each one of us receive grace for this in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Finally, number four is it blocks our access to eternity with Christ. Ungodliness. It blocks access to in eternity with Christ. Let us take note of this. Heaven is God's throne. There is no one that has a shareholding in heaven. You enter heaven on the terms of God. And God's terms for entry is godliness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 11. The Bible tells us this very clearly. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? It said, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of, man, of, of mankind. It says, nor, you know, nor thieves, nor, you know, or covetous. It said, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It said, but such were some of you. So it must be past tense to enter. Such were some of you. It said, but you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. So those things must be past tense to gain entry. If you are going to have eternity with Christ, it must be on the basis of godliness. I pray that for each one of us, the grace to live godly lives all the days of our lives will come afresh upon each one in Jesus' name. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. I said I pray that that grace to live godly lives will come afresh upon each one of us in Jesus' name. Now, to deal with the forces of ungodliness, what must we do? To deal with the forces of ungodliness, what must we do? Number one, we must stay awake to live a godly life. We must stay awake to live a godly life. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14, Ephesians 5 and verse 14, the Bible tells us there, it said, Wherefore he said, Awake thou that sleepest. And arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Awake, thou that sleepest. You cannot afford to be sleepy in this evil generation. 
Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So we must stay awake to live godly lives. We must stay awake. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 25, he said, while men slept, the enemy came and sowed tears. You see, Satan's infringement is usually at the time of sleepiness. When people have relaxed, gone into ease, when they have dropped their spiritual awareness and engagement, they open up the door for the enemy to step in. Please hear this and hear it very well. Satan is intent on destroying everyone that is a child of God. And that's why we must stay awake. It is only when you are awake that you are able to defend against every assault of the enemy. I pray that for each one of us, that grace to remain awake, spiritually awake, spiritually fervent, spiritually on fire, will come afresh upon each one in the name of Jesus. Somebody believe me, say louder, amen. amen. Number two, must understand that the battle against ungodliness is a lifelong battle. It is a lifelong battle. So we are engaging in warfare and it is a lifelong battle. Hebrews 12 and verse 4, it says there, it said, you have not resisted unto blood in striving against sin. It is a lifelong battle. Satan is continuously seeking to see how to bring people down. What does that mean? It means you can never let your guard down. Don't say, I've been working with God now for 10 years. I've been working with God now for 20 years. Saul was working with God for 40 years and still fell after it. You must never let your guard down. You must keep yourself continuously, actively connected to God at all points. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, it said, let him that thinketh his stand take heed, yes, lest he fall. In other words, if you refuse to pay attention, you open yourself to the enemy for vulnerability. I pray that for each one of us, the grace to engage in this battle to the end until we are completely victorious and we Christ. I see that grace coming upon us in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Number three, we must engage purging and purifying ourselves. We must engage purging and purifying ourselves. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 to 21. The foundation of God stands sure. It has this seal. Let everyone that named the name of God depart from iniquity. In a great house there are many vessels. Some to honor, some to dishonor. He said if a man will purge himself of this, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared to every good work. So God says we have a responsibility to purge ourselves. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 3, he said, He that had this hope in himself purified himself even as he's pure. God will not come and do it for you. God will not come and do it for me. We must purify ourselves. Shout hallelujah. We must take responsibility for purging and purifying ourselves. I see the grace of God made available for us for this in the name of Jesus. Somebody believe it, say louder, amen. amen. Finally, number four, we must strive to cast off every unwanted habit by engaging the name of Jesus in warfare. Cast off every unwanted habit by engaging the name of Jesus in warfare. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 verse 10 that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. So when we engage the name of Jesus in warfare, we are able to defeat every satanic infringement. Remember the Bible says in Philippians 2 verse 9 to 11, we are told there, it says, that he has given him a name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, of things in the earth, and things that are under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So when we engage the name of Jesus against every satanic manipulation, we are able to come out free. Shout hallelujah. So whenever you feel any motion of the flesh, whenever you feel the enemy trying to manipulate you, you can engage in warfare against that habit. In the name of Jesus, I break the siege. And when you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Shout hallelujah. 
I said, shout hallelujah. What God is saying to us very simply is this. Never take the infringement of sin lightly. Don't take it lightly. Don't take it lightly. React very fast, very firm, and do so with the forces of the Spirit, including the name of Jesus. And as you do so, you are sure to come out victorious. You will never, ever, ever be found as a victim of any satanic habit again. <laughs> By the encounter you have had upon this mountain, every chain that has kept you bound is broken. <laughs> In the name of Jesus Christ, lift your hand to heaven and give glory to God for his word that you have received. Father, thank you for your word. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Now, today is our covenant day of restoration. Our God is a God of restoration. What no man can restore, God restores cheaply. In Joel chapter 2, verse 23, down to verse 26, and verse 25 in particular, it said there, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. The canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm. I will restore to you the years. I don't know what the enemy may have consumed about the years past. But today, God will restore it to you. I said today, God will restore it to you. I said today, God will restore it to you. Now, must understand that the Holy Ghost came particularly to restore double unto us. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 7. The Bible tells us there, it says, For your shame you shall have double. For your shame you shall have double. It says, and for confusion you will rejoice in their portion. It says, for in the land you will possess the double. That will be somebody's experience here. <laughs> Whatever may have been lost to the canker worms of life, for that shame, God is restoring double to you. <laughs> I said, God is restoring double to you. <laughs> now, restoration includes the following among others. Restoration of years. There are some of us that may look back and think, oh, time has passed. Years have gone. Can anything happen again like this? God says, I am a master at restoring years. Abraham waited and waited and waited until he was a hundred years old and finally Isaac came. And somebody may have been looking and pitying him. I say, hundred years, when will he enjoy his child? But God, who is a master at restoring years, the Bible says by the time that Abraham died, he was 175 years old, which means his son was 75 years old at the time that he died. God restored the years unto him. Whatever looks as if years have gone by, and it looks as if it cannot happen again, or there will be no opportunity for it again, the God of restoration will restore the years to you. I said the God of restoration will restore the years to you. Not only that, but he restores health. Jeremiah 30 and verse 17. I will restore health unto you. He is a restorer of health. Whatever seems to have been eating at your health, consuming your body, bringing you to the captivity of sickness, disease, or weakness, Today, hell shall be restored to you. <laughs> what else is the restorer of glory? The restorer of glory. He's called the glory and the lifter up of our heads. Therefore, whatever glory has been, has been taken away before, by this encounter, God is restoring glory unto you. <laughs> I said, God is restoring glory unto you. Somebody believe it, say it louder, amen. amen. Hear what the Lord said to Israel. He said, this day is the reproach of Israel rolled away from you. Whatever represented reproach shall be rolled away today. He 
is also the restorer of honor. The restorer of honor. The restorer of honor. He said he's the one that gives honor that no one can give. In the book of John 5 verse 44, he said, Yeah, they that seek honor one from another are not the one that cometh from God only. So God is the ultimate, you know, distributor of honor. And you have come to him today. He will restore honor to you. <laughs> Maybe your home had gotten broken down into shambles. And the honor of marriage seemed to have been broken down. God will restore that home to honor in the name of Jesus. <laughs> what else is the restorer of blessing? The restorer of blessing. The blessing of the Lord will decorate every department of your life. <laughs> now, very quickly this afternoon, to secure our restoration, what, is, what must be done? We we'll look at five important things and then we are going to pray. Number one, one must be born again. The journey to restoration starts with salvation. Until you are born again, you cannot experience change in any department of your life. The change that you desire, the restoration that you require, answers absolutely to salvation. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3, he said, How can we escape our present condition if we neglect so great a salvation? The starting point is salvation. You must be born again. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if a man is in Christ, is a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So our turnaround story begins with salvation. Number two, we must receive and believe the word for our restoration. We must receive and believe the word for our restoration. In John chapter 1, verse 12, he said, blessed, he said there that, that, you know, as many as receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So what you believe out of what you have received is what determines what you become. Everyone that received him, the Bible says, they are the ones that become. They receive, they believe, they become. So we must engage faith. In the word that we receive in order to experience restoration. John chapter 10 verse 10. Jesus said, the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So abundant life, restoration of that which the enemy has stolen, only comes through Christ. And Christ there represents the word. So as we engage the word with faith, we enjoy supernatural restoration. That will be somebody's experience here. I said that will be somebody's experience here in the name of Jesus Christ. Number three, we must be committed to serving God and the interest of his kingdom. Be committed to serving God and the interest of his kingdom. We must be committed to serving God and the interest of his kingdom. I recall the testimony of one of us who at a point had been driven out of the matrimonial home for 24 years. And she began to just serve God, giving her all serving God, celebrating God, doing all that God commands, engaging in every instruction. And suddenly, the home was restored. After 24 years of being scattered, there is nothing God cannot restore. There is nothing God cannot restore. And here is what God says, Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all the things others are chasing will be, begin to run after you. That will be somebody's experience here. In the name of Jesus Christ. We have the story of Judah in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 3 to 5. Judah was in a deplorable state, vexation on every side, nothing walking everything upside down, no peace to him that went out or to him that went in. But then they turned and they began to seek God from verse 12 to verse 15. And the Bible says, as a result of seeking God, God gave them rest round about. Everything they, they lost returned supernaturally. I see that becoming somebody's experience here. In the name of Jesus Christ. Number four, we must be committed to praying for the well-being of others. Be committed to praying for the well-being of others. Job 42 and verse 10. Job was in a very desperate state. But the Bible says God turned his captivity when he prayed for his friends. Please hear this. Every time you commit yourself on the altar of prayer for somebody else's benefit, 
you are organizing favor for yourself in return. Now hear this. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 8. It said, knowing this, that and whatsoever thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord. The same. Whenever you do good for somebody, standing on the altar of prayer for them, you find out that God supernaturally visits you in your own area of need. Shout hallelujah. One of us, a mother here, had a son abroad, and the son was to be sacked from work. They called them and had told them that they were going to be released on a Friday, that they were going to be sacked, a number of them. And she came and took the, you know, uh, intercessory guideline for members and began to pray for miracle jobs for people that she knew, standing on the altar of prayer. Her son was losing his job, but she was praying for others to gain their job. By Monday, everything had been reversed, and that boy was supernaturally restored. I don't know what seems to be lost, but as you stand in the gap for others, God will visit you supernaturally. <laughs> and finally, number five, we must believe that God sent prophets are agents of restoration. God sent prophets are agents of restoration. In the book of Hosea chapter 12 verse 13, it said, by a prophet, Israel came out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. Israel had gotten to the point of slavery, not even whether they had property or not. They themselves had become property. But by the time they were coming out by prophetic intervention, they were carrying gold and silver, and silver as luggage. Possessions on every side, blessing on every side by prophetic intervention. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 22. He said, these are people robbed and spoiled, all of them in prison houses. They are for a prayer none delivered and for a spoil and none saith restore. God uses prophetic agents to declare liberty for his people. Today, as God's servant, our prophet stands upon this altar to prophesy. Every chain, every reproach, every hold of the enemy will be turned around for a testimony. You shall be supernaturally restored. You believe it? Say a loud amen. Lift your hand to heaven and give glory to God for his word that has come your way today. Father, thank you. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Before we go any further this afternoon, wherever you are, you are not born again yet. That's the starting point. Restoration cannot answer for you until you belong to him. Wherever you are today, you want to be born again genuinely. You want to surrender your life to Christ and have a genuine relationship with God. This is your opportunity. Also, there are those who need to rededicate their lives to Jesus. Something has gone wrong. You started with God at a point, but somehow you found yourself disconnected. Nobody may know it, but inside you, you know that there is no connectivity between you and God again. And you want to return to God so that you can be restored by him. Any one of us in any of those two conditions, quickly rise on your feet right now. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you all over this place. You want to give your life to Jesus? You want to rededicate your life to him? Quickly on your feet. Give Jesus a big hand, everybody. As they rise everywhere, it's worthy of praise. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your name. Quickly join the others standing right now as we get set to pray. Now, suspend filling your form for a moment and lift up your right hand before the Lord and just pray this prayer after me from the depth of your heart. Say after me, Lord Jesus, louder, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I am a sinner. I cannot help myself. But I know you died for me. On the third day you rose again, just to save me. Jesus, come into my life as my Lord and Savior. Take control of me from this day forward. I will follow you. I will serve you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your hand lifted. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for these precious ones that you have drawn today by your mighty hand. I ask that your, whole, your hand will uphold each one of them, that none of them will turn back from following after you. Thank you, mighty Father, for it. In Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen and amen. Congratulations. It's a brand new day for you. Make sure you complete your forms. Submit it to the official closest to you. 
and be reminded of the foundation class that takes place every Monday. There's a location that is not far from where you live. You'll be contacted and you'll be told where it is. Make sure you attend just two Mondays, tomorrow Monday and the upper Monday, and you have a glorious foundation for a wonderful walk with the Lord. Once again, congratulations. Shall we rise on our feet, everybody, and give Jesus a big, big hand of praise as we receive God's servant, our Father. Make it bigger for Jesus' is worthy.